you know, no progress is unilinear. And those who are articulating that struggle should understand that. If they feel that I'm wasting my time, then they'll just fall back and say, I don't want to waste my time. So I don't think you should think like that. You should think this is my goal. This is my focus. I'm going to get there. But in that, it's not my, only my goal. It's the goal of the whole lot of community. I know the differences we had in the beginning, how we put people together. I'll tell you a story. When I started doing an HIV, the HIV case, it was one person called Dominic D'Souza, who was a theater person. He's featured in that film called My Brother Nikhil. And uh, I got him out and we lost the case, but we started the battle on HIV, which ultimately resulted in a law which is passed. So that's a long story. But in between, Dominic, because he was HIV positive, he was dying. And I was called to his bedside. And I couldn't recognize him. A handsome man was reduced to uh, just skin and bones. But you know, the spirit was so much there that he, when I asked him how he was, he didn't answer. And he said, I want to know about you, what you are doing, how are this, this, that. And then he extracted a promise from me, which I've written in a in a speech called the Trist, Trist with Dominic. And it is about my promise to him to fight for HIV. And I didn't know. But when he died, it became an obsession with me. And I was mad about HIV, which then resulted in the HIV law. And similarly, I became mad about you know, gay rights. But then in a more tempered manner than I was in HIV. You have to feel the injustice of the situation. And I believe that you can only feel the pain if you interact with people who have actually been uh, victims of that. You can't have a book and read it and you will never do it. The passion comes from the interaction with ordinary people. Then you believe in something and your reasoning comes from books and reading. But in cases of social importance, these are long hauls. Like for example, drug laws, they're completely unjust, death penalty, these things are long hauls. So now we are taking up those issues. Because now this is a fashionable issue, by the way. HIV is a fashionable issue. So this will be taken over like corporates are taking over. But what I feel bad about is the fact that the judges in the Supreme Court did not decide on the basis of reason, rationality or law. That's hurtful rather than the five time, five years that went by. If the judgment had been reason, five years could have gone by by then. But because of that, for no reason at all, we lost time. And that is inexcusable. That's why I feel there has to be reform in the judiciary also. And you cannot allow uh, having judges being appointed who, who, who may have any view. I'm not bothered about the view. But when you're a judge, you have to go by the law as it is and go by precedent and give your reasons, which are all absent in caution. And that judgment had to be put in the dustbin and it has been put in the dustbin of history now. It can be struck down completely or it can be struck down in parts. So striking down in parts is sometimes called reading down because if you can't strike down the section because of the language, the structure, you then read it down to mean a particular thing. And which is that if there's consensual sex between two adults in private, then it won't apply. Otherwise, this consent is immaterial for 377. So if it is immaterial, it'll apply. Whether it's consenting adults or otherwise. So that's a big thing. But within that, the judgment speaks of a lot of things in terms of principles of fundamental rights by all judges that equality is important minorities could not be excluded everybody has a right to exist with their own personality or their own identity there cannot be any exclusion there has to be inclusion we are living in a society democratically run in a liberal constitution which has to be inclusive of people's rights so that message 
which has been there now for a number of judgments, is going down. You know, and it's poignant that it is being it's happening now when there is a reversal of that in political uh, space. The ideal way would be for the parliament to change the law or a state to change the law. But whether they do it or not, we don't know because it's not easy for them because of their popular support bading. But now, for example, if I married another man abroad, okay, he'll come to the court in India and whether that marriage is recognized or not. Now, in the old days, you'll say, I can't recognize the marriage as a judge because it's illegal. And that won't operate. Now that there is a judgment which says what it has said, then a person who is gay can stand up and say, what you're saying is wrong. That goes a long way in curbing the type of talk that goes on. And therefore, stigma reduces over a period of time. Non-LGBTQI people interact with LGBTQI people. They realize they are normal people. What about their aspirations are the same. They're, and what is there in terms of sexuality? So according to the myth that is perpetuated, gay men have anal sex with their partners. Do you think heterosexuals don't have it? So these are all myths, you know. And, oh, gay uh, anal sex is dirty. When your anal sex is clean. These are myths. The particular judge, Justice Malhotra, was quite sensitive to that issue, which is, which shows a great deal of maturity. What, what, what is the? Are we going to? You know, we have to apologize to a lot of people, and that's the right thing to do. So we, we have to do those things also on a number of other issues. We don't know where it'll stop, but that is actually telling you that the person has maturity and sensitivity. I think the political class doesn't have any vision, whether it's the BJP or the Congress. I mean, historically they've lost that. You may be in power, but if you don't have a vision of a society which is just and how justice has to be meted out to vast extent of society, you don't have any vision on that. So why do you think a lot of the NGOs are functioning? Because they don't see that vision in, in any party. They are trying to do something, they have a vision. But with the limited resources, they are working with the people. That's why NGOs are working as they are, even without money. Like our money has been frozen, but we are working. We never gave up, so you can do it. <laughs>